hello everybody and thank you for coming to listen to us talk today and so my PhD is focused on the ivory trade hence here yeah, our very cute globe trotting elephant but I'm gonna I will talk about ivory a little bit today but I will also stray further afield materially so um I think when I saw the call for papers I had a question in my mind and when I think of the global middle ages I think of people with having bird's eye view with big distribution maps of things plotted everywhere but of course, people in 5th and 6th century England, where my research is, has some of its focus, don't have big distribution maps and they can't see the world as this place. They don't see conceive the world like we do. And all of these material things that you can kind of find in early medieval graves, what do they know about them? So this is just a sort of uh, a very brief summary of the things you can find that we would consider long distance early, early medieval graves. So we can start at the bottom with amethyst beads, cowrie shells, garnets like are in the trumpet and cross up there, um, rock crystal, which probably comes from somewhere outside of Europe, um, coral beads sometimes turn up in early medieval graves, um, um, glass beads, which are made in the Indian Ocean. These ones are from um, Merovingian graves, but I don't doubt that somebody could find some in, uh, in England. And ivory rings. Um, which are made from elephant ivory. And so I want, that's the kind of overview survey. I want to give three kind of really contextual examples to try and get into the mind of these people living on the ground. What do these people who have these things, mostly in their graves, think about what these things are and where they come from? So as ivory is the focus of my PhD, we're going to start there. So um, ivory appears in one form, Elephant ivory appears in one form north of the Alps in the 5th, 6th and 7th centuries. So it's a transverse tusk from the, it's a transverse slice from the top of the tusk that is used to form the frame of a waste bag. Um, there is 752 of these in Lowland Britain, which is an amazing amount. That if you think each elephant has two tusks, that's, what's that, 375 elephants or whatever. So that's a lot of elephants that kind of move this way. And it's most abundant in the fifth century and it stops being a grave good um, by the middle of the sixth century. Um, and this is probably north of the Alps. England is the most, the place where it's most abundant. So there are some examples in Southern Germany, about a third as many as this. And some examples in Northern Germany in the fifth century, um, a small group under a hundred. So, this, to me, creates a strange problem where the focus is on what other people might see as the fringe of this kind of early medieval world. Um, so here's a reconstruction of an ivy ring as a waste bag. And so we've had this reconstruction for the past 50 years. Um, it's one that I've thought about a lot as I've collected all of this data and all of these pieces of ivory. And as you can see, there's, very, there's a very conscious effort in this reconstruction to make sure that the ivory is visible. So you can see it's on, on this one, there's kind of small tabs of leather. On this one, um, closest to me, it has, it's stitched on. So there's a very conscious effort by the archaeologists who made these reconstructions to show that the ivory is visible. And there was no archaeological evidence for that at the time that these were created. Moving on, um, this is an ivory ring bag assemblage from West Hesleton in North Yorkshire, grave 152. And it's one of only two examples where there's leather still preserved on the ivory. And this really confirms that this is a waste bag. So as you can see, these kind of, um, I don't think I haven't got a pointer, but these, there's extensive leather deposits on this ring. And the origins of the leather is obviously the main question that comes up. So these, um, but these extensive deposits show that the ivory ring was completely covered. So you take something that we think about, we might think of in it, way out of its context, so we must think it's be, it would be special, but actually it's completely covered up. And what does that mean for the people living there? Um, I've recently done some zooms analysis on the other example of leather, and the leather is actually from a goat. So we're not covering it in something fancy, we're taking the elephant and wrapping it in a goat. So what does this mean when we think about ivory? It's not a rare kind of trade good by any stretch. It's quite, actually quite an abundant uh, grave good in early medieval England if you compare it with other categories of things. It's long distance and it has to be elephant ivory because of the size and the way these objects are formed. So it has to come from 
either side of the Indian Ocean. There's a really consistent form. This is the only way it makes its way north of the Alps. So there has to be some kind of need for this specific object, whether it's an object as a ring or already formed as a bag. But also we we'll get to this idea that it's hidden. So maybe actually the long distance nature isn't, what, isn't what's important for this thing. Something else is. Um, so I want to move on from ivory um, to coral. And so it's a unique grave good in early medieval England. It comes from two cremation cemeteries in northern Lincolnshire. And um, these are the cemeteries of Cleetham and Elsham, and they are within a 10 mile radius. So it seems to be very rare within this context. It comes from two cemeteries within 10 miles. But if we think about it in the terms of these two sites, it's actually very abundant. Um, it, there's over 110 beads in total from Cleetham, and I think another 90 or so from Elsham. So there's 200 be of these beads from a 10 mile radius. And on here we can see this is some coral um, that was collected, um, probably collected, surface collected in India. And then on the bottom here you see this is what happens to coral when it's cremated. So it changes colour, and I think this maybe brings back out some issues about why we don't see coral more widely, because it has such a distinct material change when cremated. Um, so again, I want to focus in on a particular grave, so uh, cremation 168 from Cleetham. Um, so it has 51 coral beads, which is a huge amount. It's nearly half of the beads for that site. But also, if we think about this in comparison to the earlier use of coral beads in Roman cemeteries, um, the large and rich Roman cemetery at Lank Hills has eight single coral beads on eight necklaces. So that I don't think there's any way that these people are collecting them from old Roman contexts because you've got to dig up a lot of graves and you've got to disturb a lot of graves to get 51 coral beads for one person. Um, and obviously these eight from one site is very small in comparison to the 110 from Cleetham. Um, this is also a very not the most standard grave. It's a it's a biological male with a set of grave goods that are more often than not associated with a biological female. There's also an ivory ring in there. So we'll get this kind of idea that this is a very non-standard grave with a non-standard grave good in a non-standard cemetery. But still, these things have probably come from somewhere around the Indian Ocean. So as we see, it's got this restricted geographical range. It comes from with a 10 mile radius in northern Lincolnshire. It's abundant in very specific graves. So there's lots of them going about. And so maybe that means specific people within a community can have been given these or have some sort of, it's marking something out for them. It's rare on a, on a kind of a scale within other cremation cemeteries outside of this local context. So maybe that also tells where it means something local to these people. Maybe it's something that they can only get or is a marker of their local status. But again, it's long distance. But I don't think that these people, there's other things that come before this long distance nature, whether these people knew it or not, that make it more important. So I want to move on to the third material I'm going to discuss today, which is our carry shells. Um, so they're a frequent part of furnished graves across um, the 5th, 6th and 7th century in Europe. Um, and they are, all of the cowrie shells that come from these kind of graves are Indian Ocean species. Um, so we've got the panther cowrie, the tiger cowrie and the nervosa cowrie. And these all come from the Red Sea, the Indian Ocean. The nervosa cowrie actually comes from as far as the east side of the Indian Ocean from uh, modern day Thailand. So these shells are kind of procured from quite a long way. Um, but also I've, I've called it their chase and cowries. When people like me, I'm not an expert on shells, when I look at the material from a grave, I have no idea what the species is. And many people will just say, it's a, it's a cowrie shell. And that's not helpful for me or anybody when we're reading the report. Or, but also telling between the panther carry and the tiger carry isn't the easiest job in the world, um, I'm sure. So there's, um, so these shells are very distinctive. They're carry shells and, but also as we see in the top here, we have 
uh, an Atlantic uh, species of cowrie shell that would be able to be found in England. So, but these species have never been found in graves. Maybe they've been found in graves and just called a cowrie. But there's two things that I think make it very distinctive that somebody very distinctive from Indian Ocean cowries. One, these cowries have this kind of ridged surface. And if we go back, the, the Indian Ocean cowries all that are found in graves all have a very high shine. But also the size of the Indian Ocean cowries is a lot bigger. I think this cowrie can only get this local cowrie can only get about two centimeters. And I've included some pictures of on the far side of other shells you could find in the British Isles. And to me, these are just as attractive as these Indian Ocean cowries. There's an, from our modern eyes, there's nothing that would say this one is nicer than this one, but there's clearly some sort of perception that this is something different from something you go up and pick off the beach around the British Isles. Here we've got two distribution maps of where we'll find whole cowrie shells and um, beads that are cut from Indian Ocean cowries. And as you can see, there's a clear, um, the map um, on the left is quite old, but as you can see, there's a clear distinction and distribution of these shells in Kent. And I think that really focused distribution suggests that Kent is the entry point for these things. And I've talked about how specific the people choosing these carries for the graves are. And I think maybe, is that something like we didn't see for those first two examples I showed? Is that something that we can say is, these people actually know what these are. They, they know these species are coming from the Indian Ocean. But maybe, actually, if you look at this map, Kent is clear the entry point in New England, but do these people in this kind of further up belt of distribution, do they associate these things with people from Kent? Oh, I can get these things from the people on the coast down the road. Or do they think, oh, I'm getting these things from these people down the road on, at the coast. Facili are they facilitators of something else and do they know this origin? And I'm sure all of the materials I've talked about have great oral stories that we will never get to hear. We'll never get to hear what, the, what one person said at the next one that passed these goods on to them. But I think maybe this, and looking at the carry, maybe this suggests that actually there are stories attached, but we don't know what those stories are. Is the story about the person from Kent? And is the person in Kent, is their story about people from across the sea in France and Northern Germany? Or is their story about people in the Indian Ocean collecting these shells. And I think that's a really important point to make. So what does this mean for cowries? They're not particularly rare. They kind of sit somewhere between what ivory rings, where there was lots of them, and the coral beads, where they were very specific. They're easily substituted if you wanted to. You could go and pick up a nice looking shell from a beach in England, and it would make a cracking grave good. But people choose not to do that. They choose to get these, this specific species. And I think this is where we diverge from those first two examples. People want to have this thing that particularly has to come from somewhere else, wherever they perceive that to be. Um, it has this specific entry point in Kent, and maybe that is where these people perceive it to be from. It's also a raw material to make those carry derived beads. And I think there's kind of some sort of transition there, possibly. When does your carry, when is your carry used as a full carry, and when is your carry used as a raw material to make these other beads? So I think what I've tried to highlight here, hopefully I've done this successfully, is there's kind of issues of context and issues of scale here. Um, so, and I wanna go back to the question, which I tiled my presentation, do they create a false global middle ages for us? Having this bird's eye view where all these things come from in comparison to where do these people using and living with these things think they're from? And I think if we looked at this uh, kind of idea of objects without a past, maybe there's some sort of, um, explanation for that within that. Are these objects without a location? Are these objects without an origin that actually it just looks really nice, so I'll have it. And I think that's rather simplistic and I think hopefully I've shown maybe for the ivory and the coral that that's not the case, but maybe, so I think this brings to the context, within the context of specific materials, it's important to look at these things on their own and think about them as isolated groups, not just as lumps of things that all come from somewhere else. But also it's important to think about who is using this thing at an even smaller scale within each grave.